Um, so then uh, moving on to today's topic, um, we uh, are very pleased to have Christine Hausler, who will be uh, uh, introduced in more, more detail in a few minutes, but just to, uh, to introduce um, the substance a bit uh, for today, uh, Kristen will be providing us with an introduction um, to the current legal frameworks that protect cultural heritage during both international and non-international armed conflicts and how they apply both to state actors and to non-state armed groups. Um, and uh, as Noelle mentioned, this is a very timely uh, topic, um, so we're uh, really pleased to have Kristen here with us. Um, and uh, also Noelle to uh, uh, help us frame, uh, frame the session now at the beginning uh, and to, uh, to uh, collaborate with us in the Q&A uh, afterwards. Um, but for now, Noelle, would you mind uh, taking just a couple of minutes to go through the learning objectives uh, for today, so to give a little bit of a frame of, of what we're trying to cover in this short period of time. Yes, of course. So really what we're going to do today, um, we've got about five learning objectives. So the first thing uh, that Christine is going to do is to give you a basic understanding of the concept of cultural heritage and enhanced protection and the consideration of deliberate cultural cleansing in armed conflicts as a standalone war crime. It will also be helpful for you to gain more knowledge of the primary legal sources for the protection of cultural heritage in armed conflicts and the complementing role of international humanitarian law. As you will see, there's quite a lot of rules there. Um, it will also give you an awareness of implications that the qualification of a situation as either an international or an non-international armed conflict has on the protection of cultural heritage. And then also, and we're going to go more and more in the detail, so to say, um, give you an understanding of state's obligations to protect and enforce protection of cultural heritage during armed conflicts, and also, of course, the individual criminal responsibility of non-state armed groups to respect cultural heritage under international law, international criminal law, and customary law. And that session will also help you to familiarize yourself with the application of existing legal frameworks through international criminal mechanisms to prosecute attacks against cultural heritage and also, unfortunately, the legal gaps encountered when damage has been perpetrated by non-state armed groups or by states that are not parties to the 1954 Hague Convention or the Rome Statute. Angara, I'll leave it to you now. <laughs> Okay, yes, just one more quick note um, I wanted to make before going back back to you, Noel, to, to introduce Kristen. Um, uh, just to say, uh, we we have, as you can see in the chat, uh, people joining us uh, from all over the world. Um, but uh, we did want to also put up uh, put up this map so you can really see um, the amazing um, breadth uh, of uh, different geographic experiences um, that we have uh, in the uh, participant group today um, and would very much encourage all of you to continue uh, even as you're listening to the presentation and, and engaging in the Q&A uh, also to engage with each other in the chat and we really um, uh, we hope that uh, there can be multiple dimensions uh, in these online sessions uh, for making connections and learning from each other as well as our, our guest experts um, which brings me back to you Noel to uh, to do the introductions. Yeah, well, I've got the great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today, um, Kristin Häusler. And she's the Dorset Senior Research Fellow in Public International Law. Not far away actually from me, because I'm in the UK and she's there too. And she's at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law since 2007. So at present, she's leading a three-year project on the enforcement of a right to cultural heritage, as well as a follow-up study on the protection of education in the MENA region. She's also a member of the Cultural Heritage Committee of the International Law Association, for which she co-authored a report on the import and export of cultural objects. Christine is also a consultant for Geneva Corps on a study seeking to engage armed non-state actors in protecting cultural heritage. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks again, Noel, and uh, Christine, uh, welcome from me as well, and thanks so much for being here. The floor is yours for your presentation. Well, thank you very much uh, for your very kind introduction, and hello everyone. It's indeed very, very exciting to see uh, people from all over the world um, here with us today. So um, I will start my presentation, and I'm just um, 
So I'm going to start my presentation um, by looking at why does cultural heritage deserve um, protection. Well, we can think of many reasons. I've just highlighted a few here. Uh, one of them being that it is often unique and impossible to replace. It is also representative of a people's core identity, and this is why cultural heritage has often been the object of inten intentional targeting. It is also representative of the history of mankind as a whole, um, and cultural heritage is of value, of course, to the local population, but also really to all of us. Finally, the last point I wanted to highlight is that cultural heritage may also support the realization of a number of human rights, including, of course, the right to participate in cultural life, the right to freedom of religion, but also the right of minorities to enjoy their own culture and practice their own religion, etc. So in terms of the content of the session today, uh, it will be divided in three main parts. Um, I will start by discussing some key concepts, um, in particular, the, what is cultural heritage, um, and also briefly an overview of armed conflicts, um, just because um, some of you listening may not have um, an IHL background on this. I will then um, focus more on the legal framework on the protection of cultural heritage in armed conflict. The focus will be on the framework established by the 1954 um, Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural uh, Property in the event of armed conflict. And I will end by looking at accountability mechanisms. Um, and as Noel mentioned already, the ICC case, I will focus on the prosecution of individuals by international criminal courts with a brief overview of the case law. So, in terms of key concept, the first one is what do we mean by cultural heritage? Cultural heritage um, can include tangible cultural heritage. So all of the cultural heritage that is visible, that includes immovable objects. And I have put here as an example the Bridge of Mostar, which was famously destroyed and now reconstructed, destroyed in 1993 during the Croat-Bostak um, Croat War. But also movable objects and that could include paintings, culture, etc. Therefore, cultural heritage is not limited to major monuments, such as wall heritage sites, but it also includes smaller objects. As another example, you see here a picture of a Mesopo Mesopotamian cylinder seal, which is not bigger than one centimeter. However, it is a particularly valuable piece of antiquity and thus a form of tangible cultural heritage. We also have intangible cultural heritage, so a form of cultural heritage that we cannot see. This would include stories, music, dances, traditions, etc. While this form of heritage is also protected under international law, the focus today is on tangible cultural heritage, as this has been the object of particular protection in armed conflict under international law. Now, with regard to um, the second key concept, armed conflict, it may take two forms. It can be an international armed conflict between two states, but it can also be a situation of occupation um, under international law. This is considered an international armed conflict. An armed conflict may also um, be non-international in character. Uh, we refer to them as NIACs and involve a state and an armed group or two or more armed groups. There are two necessary elements for the threshold of an armed international uh, armed conflict to be reached. The hostilities must be protracted um, as well as a certain level of organization within armed groups must exist. Therefore, a situation of international disturbances and tensions such as riots, for example, do not amount to an, a non-international armed conflict. Now, why is this um, important? Well, um, the qualification of an armed conflict allows the application of the legal framework I will be explaining today, in particular the Hague Convention. As an illustration, I have here put um, an illustration of the Buddhas of Bamiyan in Afghanistan, which were destroyed by the Taliban in 2001. While there was an armed conflict in the country at the time, there was none in that region, and this attack appeared unconnected to the conflict. Thus, the legal framework protecting cultural heritage in armed conflict would likely not apply in such a context. Now, if we turn to the legal framework protecting cultural heritage in armed conflict, 
we have a number of relevant documents, including the Hague regulations, the Geneva Conventions and the Additional Protocol, the Hague Convention of 1954 and its two protocols, as well as other relevant legal instruments. While my presentation will focus on the Hague Convention and its protocols, as this is the key treaty in this area, I will briefly first mention uh, the relevant provisions in the Hague Regulations and the Geneva Conventions. The Hague Regulations uh, on the Laws and Customs of Wars on Land were the first international treaties to include provisions protecting cultural heritage in armed conflict. On this slide, you see a number of provisions that are relevant for the, uh, the um, that are relevant for the protection of cultural heritage, including the prohibition to destroy an enemy's property and the prohibition of pillaging. A key exception was already introduced then, the exception in case of military necessity, according to which it is possible to attack a military objective if such attack would help defeat the enemy. I have put examples of a few additional general uh, provisions which also apply to uh, cultural properties. But what is particularly interesting is that the Hague regulations contain provisions applicable specifically to cultural heritage. According to Article 27, in the case of a siege or bombardment, measures must be taken in order to spare edifices devoted to religion, art, science, as long as they are not used for military purposes. We have here the introduction of the concept of military use, according to which an object may become a legitimate military target if it supports the war effort. For example, if a cathedral houses troops or weapons. Article 26 prohibits to seize, damage or destroy property of religious, charitable and educational institutions and those of arts, as well as historic monuments and works of arts. It also states that such conduct should be made the object of um, the subject of proceedings. So there is no clear obligation to prosecute under the Hague regulation, something that was changed with the Hague Convention, as I will explain later. Now, if we turn briefly to the Geneva Convention of 1949, we can note that they do not contain any provision which specifically protect cultural property as they focus on the protection of persons. However, they do protect civilian properties and thus also cultural properties. Here are a few of those more general provisions. For example, we have um, Article 147 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which prohibits the extensive destruction and appropriation of property not justified by military necessity protection of private property against reprisal, prohibition of the destruction of property by the occupying power. These provisions apply in international armed conflicts as the only provision applicable in non-international armed conflict in the Geneva Convention, Common Article 3, only protects civilian persons and not properties. So with regard to the Geneva Conventions, we had to wait until the adoption of the additional protocols in 1977 to see provisions specifically uh, dedicated to the protection of cultural heritage. While Article 52 of Additional Protocol 1 protects civilian objects in general from attacks during international armed conflicts, um, unless they are military objectives, Article 53 of Additional Protocol 1 specifically protects cultural property and places of worship by prohibiting to commit any acts of hostility directed against the historic monuments, works of arts, or places of worship which constitute the cultural or spiritual heritage of peoples, to use such objects in support of the military effort, and to make such object the, ob the object of reprisals. This provision is applicable in international armed conflict, but letter A and B were very reiterated in Article 16 of Additional Protocol 2 and is thus applicable as well to non-international armed conflict. In addition, Article 87 4D 
of additional protocol one considers a grave breach of the protocol attacking clearly recognized historic monuments, works of art, or places of worship, which constitute the cultural or spiritual heritage of peoples, and to which special protection has been given, as long as they are not used militarily and are not situated close to a military objective, if this results in extensive destruction. So this is the extent of the provisions protecting cultural heritage um, within the system of the Geneva Convention. Now, if we turn to the key treaty on the topic, the Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, the framework includes, of course, the Hague Convention itself, a first protocol which was adopted the same year and which contained mainly provisions regarding situations of occupation, and a second protocol which was adopted in 1999 that was following the Yugoslav Wars, during which a lot of cultural properties suffered from damage and destruction. The picture here represents the shelling of Dubrovnik in 1991. So why was a new protocol, protocol deemed needed? Well, principally because the special protection system, um, which was put in place in the Hague Convention, did not work very well. The second protocol brought new system of additional protocol, uh, protection under which more cultural properties are eligible. It also limited the possibility to legitimately attack property under this protection. The second protocol also includes more stringent rules for invoking military necessity and it provides for clear obligation to prosecute and attach adequate sanctions. I should add, um, before going any further, that the second protocol has not been as well ratified as the Hague Convention. The, Hague, uh, the second protocol counts 68 um, state parties, while the Hague Convention has 127 state parties, and its first protocol has 104. Now, according to the Hague Convention, cultural property includes movable or immovable property of great importance to the cultural heritage of every people. This could include religious or secular monuments, archaeological sites, works of art, manuscripts, etc. While this is somewhat vague and left to interpretation, it also allows for a large number of, ob of objects to fall within this category. It also includes those buildings whose main and effective purpose is to preserve or exhibit the movable cultural property defined above. That would include museum or libraries, for example, but also shelters housing such property in time of war. Finally, it also includes centers containing a large amount of cultural property. This is the definition that you can find of cultural property in the Hague Convention. The protection of cultural property is meant to include two key obligations under the Hague Convention. First, the safeguarding um, of cultural property and respect for cultural property. So now let's look what is meant by these terms. Article 3 provides for the safeguarding of cultural property, according to which state parties must prepare in time of peace for the safeguarding of cultural property on their territory against the foreseeable effects of an armed conflict by taking a number of appropriate measures. It is thus an obligation in peacetime. A number of measures could be deemed appropriate. A few are listed in the Hague Convention itself under Article 7 such as, for example, introducing information about the Convention into military manuals, fostering respect for culture within armed forces, or establishing uh, services or specialist personnel within the armed forces. A number of um, additional adequate um, measures are listed in the second protocol in Article 5, such as the preparation of inventories, the planning of emergency measures for protection against fire or structural collapse, the preparation for the removal of movable cultural property, or the provision of adequate protection in situ, and the designation of competent authorities responsible for the safeguarding of cultural property.
And now by respect for cultural property, what the Hague Convention means um, is explained in Article 4. It includes to refrain from exposing cultural property to possible damage or destruction, including, for example, by using cultural property in a way that could make it a military objective, for example, through military use, to refrain from direct attack against cultural property, to prohibit, prevent, and stop any form of theft, pillage, vandalism against cultural property, and to refrain from any act of reprisal against cultural property. This is thus an obligation in wartime, which amounts to the general protection provided to cultural property in armed conflict under the Hague Convention. It must be noted that attacking or using a cultural property or its surroundings is allowed by the Convention in cases of imperative military necessity, a concept which must be understood within the general rules of IHL. The Hague Convention has attempted to make military necessity more limited by adding the adjective imperative. However, it has not defined it, and it is not a clear concept, and is thus very difficult to apply consistently in practice. The application of the concept of military necessity was thus narrowed by the second protocol. According to Article 6, an act of hostility against cultural property can only be lawful if that property was made by its function a military objective and if there is no feasible alternative to obtain a similar military advantage. In addition, it can only be invoked by commanding officers. An effective advance warning must be given before an attack to give the enemy a chance to change the use of the object in question. Finally, the second protocol also clarifies that the military use of cultural property is only possible for as long as there is no other feasible means to gain a similar military advantage. The Hague Convention introduced a special emblem to identify cultural heritage in the field, which is called the Blue Shield, and is pictured here. It is, its use is optional for the general protection level, but it is mandatory for objects benefiting from special or enhanced protection, which I will explain later. Christine, before you move on, can I just chip in and ask, could you please tell us if there are any specific examples where the blue shield emblems have been used in practice and if the use has been respected? Well, it is actually um, quite difficult to assess the use of the, the blue shield in practice, uh, and some people have even argued that its presence uh, may present a hit list for those seeking to intentionally attack cultural heritage. Um, but perhaps one known example um, is the giant blue shield that was painted on the roof of the Iraq National Museum in Baghdad uh, by museum staff, and that was prior uh, the 2000, 2003 invasion. Um, despite the fact that the emblem was displayed, uh, Iraqi mi military ve um, vehicles, um, which amounted to a military, a legitimate military target, were seen parked just outside the museum. So that was a clear violation of the Hague Convention. Um, those cars were later removed from that location. Um, and some would say that while the museum was looted and the scene of fighting, it was not the object of bombing of airstrikes, for example. So one may consider that the Blue Shield somewhat served its purpose uh, in the case of, of the Iraq National Museum. Mm, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. So with regard to the special protection, uh, states can request special protection for a limited type of buildings, including um, refuge sheltering cultural objects from a conflict, but not movable objects themselves, centers containing monuments, and other immovable property of great importance. It is also possible to transport cultural property under special protection. The difference with the general protection system is that states commit not to change these objects into military objectives, such as by using them for military purposes, thus prohibiting their attack. Mm 
However, such special protection is not absolute and it can be withdrawn. As I already mentioned, the conditions for granting special protection um, were quite stringent under the Hague Convention. Um, not only must the property in question not be used for military purposes, but it must also be situated at an adequate distance from large industrial center or from any potential military objective that would include an airport, a railway station, a radio station, etc. This is, of course, problematic as it provided no definition of what adequate distance means, uh, and also because many cultural properties are situated in town centers. As a result, not many sites um, were entered into the International Register of Cultural Property under Special Protection, which is administered by UNESCO. In fact, only the Vatican City and a few shelters were entered under that list. Therefore, a new system of enhanced protection was adopted with the second protocol, state must also request enhanced protection, but the requirement for granting enhanced protection are not as stringent as those governing special protection. The state in question must declare that the property in question will not be used for military purposes or to shield military sites, but there is no need for it to be located at a distance from a potential military objective. Therefore, more cultural properties are eligible, including any movable or immovable cultural property that is part of the heritage of greatest importance for humanity, which includes all cultural property falling under the 1954 Hague Convention. The system of enhanced protection is similar to, to the one under special protection. There is a protection from attacks and a prohibition on news supporting military action. An enhanced protection may be lost if the property has become a military objective because of the nature of its use. However, according to Article 13 of the Second Protocol, attack on cultural property under enhanced protection is permitted if it is the only feasible means of terminating its use and if all feasible precautions are taken to minimize damage to the property. The attack must be ordered at the highest level of command. Advance warning must be given to the enemy to offer a chance to redress the situation. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, situations of occupation amount to an international armed conflict, and the Hague Convention does contain a provision, Article 5, um, which has a number of obligations uh, for the occupying power. It must support the competent national authorities of the occupied country in safeguarding and preserving its cultural property. It must also take the necessary measures to preserve cultural property situated in occupied territory, which was damaged by military operations in close cooperation with competent national authorities. As I already mentioned, the first protocol adopted the same year as the Hague Convention, also in 1954, also focused on property in occupied territories. It gives more detailed obligation during hostilities and at the end of hostilities, including preventing the exploitation of cultural property from a territory it occupies, taking into its custody cultural property imported into its territory from an occupied territory, and at the end of hostilities, returning cultural property um, to the competent authorities of territory previously occupied, as well as pay an indemnity if it failed to prevent the exportation of cultural property from the territory it occupied. Finally, cultural property coming from the territory of a state party and deposited by it in the territory of another state party for safekeeping during an armed conflict shall also be returned. Now, let's see if the key obligations of the Hague Convention also apply in non-international armed conflict. According to several articles, state parties must respect cultural property, whether it is on their own or an enemy's territory, and whether conflict is international or non-international. This is also the case with regard to the second protocol. Now, with regard to non-state armed groups, um, Article 19 uh, refers in the case of a NIAC to each party to the, to the conflict, and thus also to non-state armed groups. 
They must respect cultural property, referring to the prohibition of attack and military use of cultural objects, and endeavor to bring into force by means of special agreements all or part of the other provisions of the, of the present convention. In fact, um, a number of non-state armed groups have adopted their own manifesto, committing themselves to protect cultural heritage. With regard to enforcement, in case of breaches of the convention, states have an obligation to prosecute offenders of any nationality and impose sanction. This obligation, as contained in Article 28 of the Hague Convention, was rather vague. And this is why Article 15 of the Second Protocol uh, provides some clearer um, provisions with regard to individual criminal responsibility and universal jurisdiction for making cultural property the object of an attack, for using cultural property under enhanced protection in support of military action, for extensive destruction of cultural property, as well as theft, pillage of misappropriation of, or act of vandalism directed against cultural property. State must um, criminalize this violation under domestic law and assign them appropriate sanction. And in case of violation, they must either prosecute or extradite the alleged perpetrators. Now, a number of the rules that I've mentioned um, are considered part of customary international law. I don't have time to go uh, into details, but I would refer you to the ICRC study on customary international law, in particular to Rule 38241, um, which are here summarized and include the prohibition of attack and military use, unless in case of military necessity. So those rules would then apply uh, to anybody taking part in a conflict, including non-state armed groups. So I have focused so far on the Hague Convention, but there are other relevant legal instruments which also protect cultural heritage in armed conflict, including the Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property, the 1970 UNESCO Convention, which, for example, requires states, parties to protect cultural heritage on their territory against looting and illicit export. We also have the framework established by the 1972 World Heritage Convention, which lists cultural um, sites deserving particular protection and highlights those sites that are in danger, for example, because um, of the threat of an armed conflict. The Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage also has, has a couple of relevant provisions, as well as the Protocol on Prohibition or Restriction on the Use of Mines, Booby Traps, and Other Devices of 1980, um, which forbids in all circumstances the use of booby traps on historic monuments, works of art, or places of worship. There are also a number of soft law instruments which have been adopted. Often that was in reaction to the large amount of destruction of cultural heritage, for example, we have um, here the Declaration Concerning the International Destruction of Cultural Heritage, adopted in 2003, as well as the Cairo Declaration on the Protection of Cultural Property, just as a couple of examples. So despite the existence of the legal framework I just explained, there are continuous challenges to the protection of cultural heritage, with many recent examples of destruction in Iraq, Mali, and Syria. The international community has regularly reacted to these events. Here you can find some of the resolution adopted by the United Nations Security Council, which are concerned with cultural heritage, urging states to facilitate the return of cultural property from such states, as well as to prohibit the sale of objects originating from them. Now, turning briefly to accountability mechanisms focusing on international criminal justice, it is worth first remembering that at Nuremberg, some individuals were found guilty of the war crime of destroying cultural property. And most of the statutes of international um, or internationalized criminal tribunals contain provision with regard to cultural property, including the ICTY, the ECCC, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, as well as the ICC. 
Um, Christine, yes. sorry to interrupt you again, but uh, among the questions we have received in advance, there's one that actually you might be able to answer at this stage. It was asked by Joanna, are there any legal mechanisms for the assessment of loss and damages to cultural property in addition to those aimed at prosecuting cultural war crimes? So there are a number of mechanisms to highlight the risk faced by cultural heritage in armed conflict uh, contexts. For example, um, I mentioned the system of the 1972 World Heritage Convention, which updates its list of protected sites which are in danger. Um, ICOM as well, the International Council of Museums, publishes an emergency red list which uh, catalogues archaeological objects or works of arts, which are considered endangered because they originate from states in situation of armed conflict. Now, in terms of assessing damage after conflict, um, you generally have several organizations which may be involved, including the International Committee of the Blue Shield, for example. Uh, the main one, of course, is UNESCO, given its mandate uh, to assure the conservation and protection of the world's cultural heritage. It routinely conducts um, such assessment after conflict. Um, and for those that are interested, for example, um, I saw that last June, uh, UNESCO published a report with satellite-based damage assessment of cultural heritage sites in Iraq, Nepal, Syria, and Yemen. Um, such analysis is now conducted uh, quite regularly. Um, and I know that there is a memorandum of understanding on, on this in particular signed between UNESCO and UNITAR, uh, which was um, signed last year. So it is something that is that is done on a regular basis. Mm, very interesting. Thank you. So now if we look at the case law, well, most of the existing case law in this area has been established by the ICTY. Um, which has found individuals guilty of the war crime of destroying historic monuments, such as the, the Struger case, which concerned the shelling of Dubrovnik. Um, what was interesting in this case is that the old city was considered especially protected because of its world heritage status. Um, although it did not benefit from any special protection regime under the Hague Convention, uh, as it had not been listed as such, and of course, uh, also not from the enhanced protection regime as the second protocol had not been adopted at the time. Tadic is also an important case in this area as it established that the protection of, of destruct, the prohibition of destruction of cultural property is part of customary international law. Um, and it also applies to the parties to a non-international armed conflict. Now, beyond war crimes, the destruction of cultural properties um, was also considered as a possible crime against humanity. In these cases, damaging institutions dedicated to Islamic religion or education were deemed to constitute an act of persecution, which is a form of crimes against humanity, if conducted with a discriminatory intent. Finally, um, the destruction of cultural property does not amount to um, the crime of genocide. Um, however, the destruction, the systematic destruction of cultural and religious property may be considered as evidence of intent to commit genocide when those attacks occur at the same time um, as the physical destruction of a group of persons. Now, to end this presentation, um, I'll briefly consider the role of the ICC in prosecuting attacks against cultural heritage. In order for the ICC to prosecute um, the alleged perpetrator of an attack against cultural heritage, it must be seized with the situation in question. This can happen uh, in three different ways. A state party can refer a situation, um, including uh, self-referral, which happens quite often, which was the case actually in the Al Mahdi case with Mali self-referring its situation to the ICC. Also through a referral by the Security Council, or when the prosecutor take the initiative to conduct an investigation with regard to alleged crimes which have taken place in states or by the national of states that are party to the ICC statute or have accepted the court's jurisdiction. So as mentioned at the beginning of this session, um, on Tuesday, um, Ahmad Al-Faki Al-Mahdi was condemned to nine years of imprisonment for having intentionally directed attacks against 10 monuments in Timbuktu in um, 2000, uh, um, 
um, a couple of years ago, apologies. Um, and this is, of course, a landmark case, as it is the first ICC case focused on attacks against cultural property um, as a war crime. And I will end my presentation here and await your questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, we do have a lot of great questions uh, that have come in. Um, I'll get things started. And Noelle and I uh, will take turns uh, during the, the coming 15 minutes um, posing questions. So first of all, uh, you mentioned uh, at the end uh, here of your presentation the International Criminal Court, ICC. Um, and uh, it's uh, of course, uh, the case has been noted by a few people that neither Syria uh, nor Iraq have ratified uh, the Rome Statute. Um, so we have a few people wondering how uh, how then does uh, does it apply in those territories? Are there other uh, le legal frameworks uh, that apply in the case of um, a state that has not ratified the Rome Statute? So I mentioned that the UN Security Council could refer a situation to the ICC. Um, and that could include a situation occurring in states that are not party to the Rome Statutes. Um, so it could apply in relation to Syria or Iraq. In addition, the nationals of state parties may be prosecuted by the ICC. Um, so in case, for example, there is a foreign fighter, a national of a state party, which operated in, in Iraq or, or um, in Iraq or Syria, the prosecutor could investigate on its own initiative they are alleged um, unlawful acts. So it is not impossible to prosecute attacks against cultural heritage in, uh, in Syria and Iraq before the ICC, but it is very, very unlikely, um, as um, I think you were alluding to. Um, but what should, I think, not be forgotten um, is that the ICC functions on the basis of complementarity and that domestic courts should first prosecute those crimes. Uh, and it's only if unable or unwilling to do so that the ICC may then pursue such cases. Both Iraq and Syria um, are party to the Hague Convention, which provides that states have an obligation to prosecute offenders of any nationality and impose sanction. Um, so it is possible that at some stage uh, they could be prosecuted um, at the domestic level. Um, and with regard to other frameworks, well, both Syria and Iraq are likely to also have domestic provisions uh, which criminalize us, such conducts. Um, so it is possible that alleged perpetrators uh, could be prosecuted at the end of the conflict or that an international tribunal or another reparations mechanism could be set up, uh, for example, in Syria to address um, those type of violations that are currently still occurring. OK, thank you very much. Over to you, Noel. Yeah, we have received a huge number of questions. So I'm going to start with one, um, which we have somehow mentioned already a bit before, but the, the legal framework and the accountability, the enforcement of this legal framework. So we have a question by Jonathan, which is, do you feel that the current legal framework provides enough tools even if properly enforced, for the protection of cultural heritage in armed conflicts? And if not, how can this framework be supplemented or improved? Um, that's a very good question, because as, as you've seen, the framework is, is quite complex. Um, but we still have a lot of occurrences in practice, of course, uh, of, of a lot of violation. So I think that the system established by the Hague Convention is certainly not perfect. Uh, but it has been significantly improved by the second protocol. And I think perhaps what is first needed is to increase ratification of the second protocol. I know that there's been several calls uh, to that effect, but uh, I will perhaps add my own. State parties must then also ensure that it is properly enforced, um, not only with regard to adopting domestic provisions, criminalizing breaches of the convention, but also by ensuring um, that the, st the relevant stakeholders are aware of how it functions. And I think that uh, we often talk about uh, the obligation to respect cultural property during armed conflict. And what is perhaps sometimes a little bit forgotten is the obligation um, taking place in peacetime, so to take um, adequate measures um, to foresee the negative effects of an armed conflict on cultural heritage, so conducting inventories, training personnel, etc. And I think that could very much limit the damage uh, that uh, takes place in times of, of armed conflict. Um, one particular issue, of course, is that a lot of conflicts are now 
non-international in nature uh, and that non-state armed groups are party to such conflicts. Um, the issue here in general is that they don't have um, the same knowledge of the legal framework as national armed forces. Um, and they may also lack any information on the presence of cultural heritage in, in certain areas. So um, I think um, a lot more work should be done to um, render those types of groups aware uh, of the rules uh, protecting cultural heritage in armed conflict. And on this note, I would just uh, mention that Geneva Call, a uh, Geneva-based organization engaging with non-state actors, is currently conducting a study which seeks to assess the feasibility to engage um, are non-state actors in the protection of cultural heritage, um, and a study will be, will be published on this topic um, next year. Well, thank you very much. For, can I just have a follow-on question? Uh, Paul was actually asking if you would know whether there is legal counsel, which is sometimes often, um, which is offered to armed forces. Do you know of any sort of states that have good practice in terms of training their staff, offering legal counsel? Is there any good practice we can rely on? Um, in terms of, do you mean in terms of engaging with heritage professionals and armed forces? Yes, indeed, yes. Yes. Um, so I have um, been speaking with somebody who was involved here before um, the Iraq invasion with the, the Ministry of Defense here in the UK, and uh, they would work on establishing maps um, and actually train um, armed forces on what cultural heritage me meant in a particular context and to make them aware um, and develop something like a no-hit list, um, if you wish. The issue, of course, is that heritage professionals may sometimes have an ethical dilemma in terms of um, um, speaking to armed forces in case they are like against um, um, a particular invasion. Um, but I think that they have a very, very important role to play. Um, and one of the, uh, the, the measures that are suggested in the second protocol uh, and the Hague Convention in peacetime is indeed to engage more with heritage um, professionals uh, within the armed forces and even perhaps to um, have and train specialized personnel. So I think that they have um, a very important role to play um, and I know that they have done so already um, on a number of occasions, at least uh, during the uh, Iraq invasion. Thank you. Great. Uh, perhaps a follow-up um, question on that. So you were talking about the role of heritage professionals, and we did have uh, one of our participants asking, uh, also, in, in addition to the role of heritage professionals, what would you feel uh, would be some of the roles for uh, humanitarian workers uh, with respect to uh, trying to uh, increase protection of uh, cultural heritage in armed conflict, um, so separately from specifically heritage professionals? Right, so, so I think for uh, humanitarian actors, I, I guess we could do uh, similar recommendations, uh, at least if they are not obligation, is to gain knowledge of cultural heritage from heritage professional uh, before they go and operate in certain areas. And I would like to give you an example here, and that comes actually from uh, the situation of armed forces uh, in Iraq and not of humanitarian actors, but I could see that it could perhaps also happen to humanitarian actors. Um, the um, US military forces had built a military camp above ancient ruins in Babylon, in Iraq, um, and by doing so, they, they damaged the site quite a bit. So I think it is quite important to, before going into an area, to really be aware of what archaeological sites are present because they are not necessarily visible to somebody who is not a professional in the area and to really gain knowledge of what kind of cultural heritage they may encounter. Um, I think they may play um, many other uh, roles and, and functions in, in protecting cultural heritage. For example, if they have the knowledge of the legal framework, they can help to identify violations of international um, law protecting cultural heritage, perhaps collect evidence when appropriate. Um, what we have seen with the recent case of Al-Mahdi um, is that it was prosecuted very rapidly. Um, there was a guilty plea, but it was also because there was a large amount of evidence that had been provided. 
Um, and perhaps they could also, if they have gained knowledge of cultural heritage, advise the population on cultural heritage protection or, la or at least liaise between population, um, gather their concern um, and, and the armed forces and perhaps serve, serve as a link. Great, thank you. I have another question which relates to actually what happens when international humanitarian law does not apply anymore. Um, one of our participants is asking, how can both cultural heritage in terms of site and property movables be protected in a peacekeeping mission when the hostilities have ceased and as a result the situation is not an armed conflict anymore? How can we protect the cultural heritage then? Um, well, I think there are a number of legal frameworks that apply that I have that I have not uh, had the time to to really go into. So, in addition to, to the, those provisions that apply in time of armed conflict, uh, we shouldn't forget that the international human rights framework also continues to apply during an armed conflict. Um, it applies, yes, before and after a conflict has ceased. Um, the right to, to access cultural heritage is considered a human right in itself. Uh, it's enshrined uh, in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights. Uh, and for those interested in, in access to cultural heritage as a, as a human right, uh, I would perhaps refer you to the General Comment 21 uh, of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, but also to the report of the former Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, uh, which was published in um, 2011 on the right of access to and enjoyment of cultural heritage. Now, with regard to international treaty law, um, I have mentioned a number of, of instruments that could apply and, and could be of interest also in peacetime such as the World Heritage Convention, of course, but also the Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural, her her uh, cultural Property, because they apply um, at all times. Um, and finally, um, a lot of domestic laws um, also contain protection of cultural heritage, and they're, they're likely to, to, con to contain um, such provisions in a lot of, of countries now where, where we see a conflict. Uh, in the cultural heritage discourse, they are often considered as source countries, as countries that are very rich in archaeological uh, resources, and they generally have a very long-standing domestic laws protecting cultural heritage. So I would also look uh, into the domestic legal framework of each of those states. Thank you. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, I, I'm going to have to say we're running uh, to the end of our time uh, for our, our hour here uh, with Kristen. So we're going to have to bring it to a close. But before we do, I would like to give you the floor uh, one more time, Kristen, if you'd like to give any, uh, any brief concluding uh, thoughts, anything you'd like to leave us with today. Now I'd like to thank everybody for their attention. Um, I hope they gained something from, from the training session. I understand that there's been a lot of questions that have come through, and I guess they will be submitted to me, and I'll do my very best to answer them um, um, along the way. Um, and I hope we can continue this, this discussion somehow um, uh, beyond this, this training session as well. Absolutely, and I yes, it's it's absolutely true. We have a lot of questions that have come in, um, uh, really interesting ones that we will uh, uh, need to follow up as much as we can. So um, very appreciative indeed, um, Kristen, of your your willingness to help us with that and also to keep the conversation uh, going. It's clearly an issue of uh, tremendous concern. Um, from a number of different uh, parts of the sector. So thank you so much for that. And, and now uh, over to you, Noel, uh, if you'd like to um, uh, also leave us with any, uh, any highlights, uh, any takeaways uh, that, that you saw from this past hour uh, that we should uh, remember. Well, I have to say, I have learned a lot, <laughs> and I'm supposed to be a specialist in international and law. So thank you so much, Christine, for this fantastic presentation. Um, I think the main point that we also had in the questions also, unfortunately we couldn't answer them, was the, the definition of cultural heritage. That, that's something that you mentioned quite a lot, also the importance of qualifying the conflict, whether it's international or non-international. But there are also, like you said, a number of instruments that do apply when there is no armed conflict, and we still can't 
protect the cultural heritage. And as you pointed out, the, the main treaties are indeed the 1954 Hague Convention and the two protocols. And well, it's actually quite good to hear that more and more the accountability mechanisms are, are being used and that the international criminal courts are looking into such violation. So it, it was a fantastic um, session. Thank you so much. <laughs> And, and thanks to you, Noel, uh, for helping us with it and serving as a co-host. Very much appreciated and looking forward to, uh, to doing it again sometime soon. Um, so, yes, uh, so, uh, so we've come to the end of our hour. Um, I will be uh, now taking a few minutes because we do have quite a, a number of uh, sessions actually coming up. So um, uh, very much recognizing that some of you may have to sign out now because uh, you had allocated just an hour for this. But I'll spend just a couple of minutes now highlighting some of the upcoming events uh, that we have and saying just a few brief words about those. Um, that's uh, in our series of events related specifically to humanitarian law and policy. And we hope uh, very much to welcome uh, all of you again sometime uh, in the near future. Um, so uh, well, before I do, uh, just to make sure uh, that I mention, we will have, I know several of you were asking, the recording uh, and also a number of uh, related resources to today's event. Those uh, will be available very shortly on the PHAP website uh, on the event page. Uh, you see the link there in front of you. Uh, so those will be available in the coming days and we'll be sending out an email uh, to let you know when the recording is up so you can make sure uh, to have access to that. Um, and then uh, for upcoming events, so as I'm going through uh, the list, if you already know that you'd like to register, you can go ahead actually and click on the banner and that will bring you to the registration page. So if you want to make sure you don't forget, uh, you can take care of that uh, already now. Um, so our next session, um, that will be on the 21st of October and we'll be looking at the issue of legal protection of re refugees and forcibly dis displaced persons. Um, as uh, many of you know, of course, the, um, the current refugee system has been uh, put under great stress by the scale uh, and the complexity of recent and ongoing developments. And uh, now in the wake of the high-level plenary on addressing large movements of refugees and migrants, um, uh, which took place uh, just a few days ago, uh, as well as the U.S. Leaders Summit on Refugees. Um, these both took place in mid-September. We're going to be organizing a session with uh, another one of our members and, and experts, Jean-Francois Derieux, who's the director of the International Refugee Law and Migration Law Program at the International Institute of Humanitarian Law, the IIHL. And our aim here is to build, um, try to build a greater understanding of the current legal frameworks that protect refugees and forcibly displaced people, um, as well as some of the, the legal and operational uh, limitations uh, that have come, um, come to the fore uh, recently. Uh, then on the 1st of November, we'll be having a session, and this will be uh, in our expert briefing sessions, we're really going to be looking um, at a high level at a very specific area um, of uh, the law of armed conflict. We're looking at the issue of war algorithms and international law. This is really designed uh, for those of you who are legal advisors and, and uh, working at an expert level with the law, looking into the accountability uh, for technical autonomy in armed conflict. That will be with Nazmo Dirzadeh and Dustin Lewis from the Harvard Law School Program on International Law and Armed Conflict. Um, then on the 8th of November, uh, we're going to be having another expert briefing looking at the issue of hostile intent and civilian protection, looking at some specific lessons and cases uh, from recent conflicts. And that's going to be with Bonnie Darty, uh, who is uh, with Harvard Law School uh, IHRC. Um, and then last uh, in our immediately upcoming list here on the 15th of November, uh, we have a learning session looking at the legal dilemma of detention in non-international armed conflicts. And that will be, uh, again, with a frequent contributor to our courses, Gabor Rona, who uh, uh, previously 
career was uh, with the ICRC as a legal advisor, um, and then has moved through uh, through several organizations now with uh, in academia at Cardozo Law School in the United States. So very happy to have him um, joining us again um, for a session again looking at the issue of, of detention in non-international armed conflicts. Uh, so once again, hope that you will um, that you uh, really. Uh, learn something also as, as we all were from today's event um, and uh, that you will consider joining us again in the near future. We look forward to in touch with you then. This is Herod Lang and the rest of the PHAP team here um, signing off from Geneva. Thank you.